Thanks for being here and with us another day. And without any delay, I'm Sylvia Gina Hunt, and I'm saying hello. And I'm going to introduce this fabulous Miss Ron Amber. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, like Gina said, my name is Ron Amber, and I'm from Dallas and um, here in the city um, to share some poetry with everyone. Um, so I have decided to sort of, uh, you know, I was inspired. Um, to put this particular group of poems together um, and to call it Hot Banana Pudding um, because one of my favorite dishes is the hot banana pudding that my sister makes. And so I have two sisters and they both make hot, they both make banana pudding, but uh, my sister, mm -hmm. uh, my, my older sister makes hers hot and the other one makes it cold. And the hot banana pudding reminds me of my grandmother. And okay. so uh, when I was thinking about my poetry, um, and, you know, sort of if I were to title uh, a series of poems, I thought about hot banana pudding. So that's why, you know, I'm here to share some, some, some poetry from the hot banana pudding well, poetry please, series. Well, please, let's get started. Okay. So, between the main block of jazz and young jock is a woman on the corner with a soul in a box. She's moving to the moon real soon, she says. Every afternoon in June is crazy. She puts the tip of a spoon against the walls of a room. Her dreams got tuned. She sings like this. Her riff got soul, got voice, got fist. Her riff got soul, got voice, got fist. I was arriving in the future. Love in my back pocket and the sun in my dreadlocks. Passport cocked between my two fingers. Tears behind my eyeballs because the struggle in my living room still lingers with me. I stepped into the city after myself. The world is singing to me because I am all that's left over from my grandmother's shoulder to my mama. Tears played across my living room. I am that mellow drama and the heir to all of the karma that found me with generations of excuses wrapped around me. I stepped soundly into the growth trying to drown in the fact that I have the act to do things profoundly if I can humble my soul to mumble my ancestors around me and hold tight to the God that loves loudly and bright yellow my rainbow. I was arriving in the future. So that was the first poem um, that I want to share. Oh, I just love that. that, that deep. It was a poem that I wrote uh, years ago while I was living in Berlin. And Berlin? You mean Berlin, Germany? Yes, yes. Okay. So I lived in Berlin for four years, and while I was there, um, I got together with a group of amazing artists and we decided to call ourselves the New Night Babies. And um, we're sort of a spoken word band. And Arriving in the Future is the very first song that we did as a collective. Okay. Okay. And so um, in the poem, I talk a lot about, you know, sort of traveling from Texas to Berlin and all of the things that I carried with me, like my passport. Um, and. Um, the understanding that um, being, uh, you know, the first person in my family to travel abroad, that there was this sort of, um, this privilege that I was carrying with me and this charge to sort of go out into the world and, and to do something and to, and, to, and to create something beautiful. So um, for me, that thing has always been poetry. Oh, wow. Yeah, so. That is great. Um, another poem that I want to share um, is a poem that I wrote um, also during that time, it's called Superstar, mm -hmm. and it is also inspired by many things, as you'll hear, um, including um, my brother, my oldest brother. And so there are... Do you have a big family? I do. I have a big family. I have... Um, Siblings? On my, mother's, on my mother's side, there are six of us. Wow. Okay. I am the youngest girl, and then I have a little brother, so I'm number five. Okay. And um, quite often... The joke in my family is that, uh, you know, everybody always ends up in a poem. So if you <laughs> listen to my poetry, you know, uh, you, you really can sort of find out my family narrative because I write a lot about my family and my brothers and my sisters and our family and I experience, uh, you know, sort of growing up and really just trying to figure out and navigate uh, the ways of, of Oak Cliff, which is the neighborhood I'm from in, in Dallas. Okay. So, um, this poem is called Superstar. I don't want to live vicariously through a superstar. 
I want to listen to Michelle and just vibe to my revolution with tracks 8 and 18 just singing in the background. Wherever I am on my way to a village in Africa or on a flight to a district in Austria or walking or riding the bus anywhere outside of my American dream, I don't want to live vicariously through a superstar and just settle for the way things move around me. We astound me, see the box folding profoundly and move to accommodate our blue state, drowning the brown. Poetically, I was found as a stranger in a corner of a closet, beckoning those to come and service me while I contemplated the pose of female Moses, the most deserving she of kin to me who got jiggy with a path I heard calling me to just be free. I don't want to live vicariously through a superstar. So I'm telling myself, come out, come out, whoever you are. I love the first love of my life from afar. Nabita, sweet ofula, fikoti, naya. I don't want to live vicariously through a superstar. Because I got way too much flavor to be content on a new car, Purple Converse, with the one star. I got to learn to read beast between these lines, because every car is going to find my fist trying to retwist number seven on the list of poets. Just give me the gift. Just give me the gift to uplift my fifth, cause if I had been the last one, I'd be my mama's son with the sun staring into me like my brother Half Note daring him to be that sixth man. I got a mad quote that I wrote for High C. Don't let the system defeat you vicariously through that superstar. Cause there's an instrumental in my ear, got sounds of creek beds trying to trap a boy called Creek Monster between high school hallways and the solace of his own existence. And the judge will sentence him to die before he forced those rocks to cry against that lie, the ones that shield his know-how from his know-why to be about his right now. I don't want to live vicariously through a superstar. I want to be a dope line on the back of somebody's t-shirt. I went to daydream about Rastafarian seated Indian style on European street corners singing Natty Dread for Change at 2 o'clock in the morning, soul playing chorus on the pulse of morning. What if the sun lived vicariously through the moon and you never felt the presence of the afternoon blues, never set the sun setting hues across your sky blue mood? Tell me then which superstar would be your food. Tell me then which superstar would be your food. Thank you. I have to give you a, a <laughs> clap and an ovation on that. And the other one, too, actually. I should have clapped for both of them. But that was just, um, just um, a, You know, something that I like uh, about writing is that it always sort of gives you the chance to pull in the experiences you make, you know, out in the world. And so in that particular poem, um, I was thinking a lot about the time that I spent um, studying abroad. Okay. Um, and living in Vienna, Austria, mm -hmm. and just the the experiences that I made with other people, sort of, you know, homeless people living on the streets. Um, specifically, um, when I visited Amsterdam, and just sort of, you know, two or three o'clock in the morning, you have um, these men who have these amazing voices just outside, sort of sitting on the curb, singing reggae music really loud. Mm -hmm. Sometimes playing an instrument, sometimes just, you know, singing a cappella. And so, um, you know, I think about them a lot when I write, uh, and I think about their experiences, and I think, wow, you know, sometimes we, we have this idea of what life is going to be like for us, and, you know, we can move towards it or not, um, depending on how we, um, how we see ourselves as a part of the big picture. So um, I really like to sort, sort of, write, you know, bring a lot just of that sort of reflect. Oh, okay. Oh no, that was nice. Your brother has to just be so proud of that. Yeah, yeah. when he heard it, you know, whenever he gets a chance to hear my poetry, he's always very uh, supportive, supportive, and very inspired, um, and also just a bit shocked that I sort of have that I paid so much attention, um, and then can remember it and put it into sort of you know a concrete um, expression in a way. So. Um, but no, all of my family is very supportive. They're really good sports about me sort of exposing their lives in my poetry. So <laughs> I really appreciate that they've always, my entire career as a poet, uh, as a writer, my entire life, they've always been very, uh, very supportive and, and very sort of, you know, open to sharing, to me sharing their life through my poetry. 
Well, that is amazing. So I just can't wait to one day grab you and the whole band. I would love to. The New Night Babies and bring the whole band and set up and uh, the performance. I would and the love music. to. I would love to. Uh, I would love to see uh, us all here together. You know, sometimes it's challenging because they live in Berlin and I live over here in the States. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, trying to figure out, you know, the, the politics of cost and how we, you know, how we sort of figure out the financial part of just moving, you know, all at one time uh, together. Uh, it, it's just a lot more feasible for me to go there. But And then um, it's easier. That's when you can do Paris, London. Right, right, because you can move around Europe a lot more. Uh, uh, frequently and, frequently and, and easily. And right, right. And so it's a lot more affordable to, right. to travel over there. But, um, but we haven't given up hope. We talk about it. We still keep it on the radar. And, uh, you know, when the opportunity presents itself, then we're going to be ready. So I know that's right. I definitely, uh, definitely know that. But um, moving right along, right? Ambo, I don't uh, want to take away the time. I want everybody to hear and enjoy <laughs> and feel your presence. Okay. So uh, the next poem is a poem. It's called Skin Politics, and it's, a, it's, it's sort of a, a short piece um, that will go directly into a piece called Five Shades of Brown, which is a poem that I... Um, that I have always sort of really um, has meant a lot to me because it's sort of a, a snapshot mm -hmm. um, of five different people who are very important to me. Um, and uh, some of them very close to me and some of them distant strangers who I actually never had a conversation with, but coming across, uh, coming across them in my life, um, they really had a great impact on me. And I don't think that they, you know, certainly I, I know that they don't all know it. Um, because I never had a chance to tell them, but um, so, some great writers are you talking about? Not great writers, them? just characters. Characters. Um, so I'll, I'll do the poem, and then afterwards I'll kind of explain a little bit. So, skin politics have bits and pieces of jaded conflict stuck in the creases. At least it's just the hustle and bust of moving bodies over broken trust. A little more less than you can ask for. The rougher the tough, the tougher the crust gets baked brown, and the sound of vibrations deep down. I know this boy named Ennis. His mama smoked crack. She put him outside when the moon came out. When the sun came, she called him back. He was about 80, roamed around trying to find a space to fit in. Cried to himself because he was all he had left. We moved and ain't seen him since then. Then this old man, trash bag in his hand, talked fast and wore locks on his boots. He walked real slow and stepped soft everywhere like he thought somebody was going to shoot. But supposedly his story is that he was a soldier and went off to fight in the war, came back home with his mind all gone shell shock while he walked to the store. Then this girl named Tasha, birthday in June, sang in the choir, smiled like the moon. She laughed like this cat I heard sing the blues, like Cab in his own on the track scat the muse. She got caught up in a U-Haul truck between right now and nowhere at all. Disappeared one day on the bus, they say all she left was her name on the wall. Then this Nigerian dude that I met in Vienna say, he know refugees going insane, riding in the jail because Border Patrol can't tell if their passport matched their names. So uh, I'm, the first guy that I talk about is a man who lived in the apartments that we lived in um, at one point in my life. and. Mm -hmm. He was, an old, he was an older guy, an old mm -hmm. man, um, who would walk around the apartments very quietly, mm -hmm. never bothering anybody. Um, but he always had these padlocks on his boots, and I never understood mm -hmm. that. Did it um, represent something? Is that well, the um, I never had a chance to talk to him because I was never brave enough to sort of walk up to him and go, what are those, boots, those locks doing on your boots? <laughs> and as kids... You know, we sort of, you know, we stayed, we kept our distance because he was, you know, sort of. He was of, an adult. He was an adult. Right. And, um, and we were also just curious, but not sort of, uh, we didn't have really the language to actually approach him in any type of, uh, I think, constructive way. So we just right. sort of stayed away. Okay. Um, and um, never really talked to anybody, in a, an adult about him. And he was just a character. He was just someone who lived there that everybody knew about, but nobody really sort of engaged in any kind of conversation. Um, and then later, um, the story sort of came out that he was a war veteran. Okay. And was suffering from some form of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it was assumed that uh, he was sort of always sort of walking very softly and carefully around the apartment complex because he was replaying these sort of war scenes of, 
um, being in the war, being and watching the, for bombs, right, watching for bombs and things like that. And so, mm -hmm. uh, when I got older and I was um, and I became aware of of the idea of shell shock and you know sort of the experience that a lot of lots of veterans have, sort of dealing with the mental um, sort of um, elements of of, of post-war experiences and um, it, I was just really touched to remember him and to realize that he had been sort of experiencing something like that um, and also just knowing in my sort of uh, in my in my my ignorance of, of the whole experience uh, that I didn't really have any type of intellectual you know capacity oh, you to really know. How old right? were you? Okay. I was about um, I would say 12 Okay. I was I was about twelve, okay. um, but I still wished that I had you know sort of had a chance to engage him in some sort of conversation um, okay. to just learn about him and who he was. I don't even know his name. Okay. So um, so putting him in the poem was a way of sort of maybe going back and, and sort of paying tribute to him. Um, and then I talk about a very a very close friend. Uh, oh, actually, then the next person is um, this little boy named Ennis, who okay. was a kid who hung out in the apartments and. Um, and he did have a mother who had a drug addiction, and uh, and he spent a lot of time outside, um, mm -hmm. even you know, sort of overnight. You know, my sister and brothers would come in the house and say that they saw him sort of by himself outside mm -hmm. um, because his mother had an addiction, and and she was you know entertaining, um, you know, and he was outside. Um, and at least she had the sort of I think awareness to sort of send him out to not sort of have him around during that mm -hmm. um, time. But he was. Um, I just remember sort Did of him being... Did he have food Did she give him meals? Or um, I don't think that he was hungry. I do remember mm -hmm. every now and then, like, sort of neighborhood families just offering him something to eat. For Thanksgiving, having him come over or um, something? Not like that, but just sort of, you know, you want a sandwich or, mm -hmm. you know, okay. as, as kids sort of do, running out, running in and out of people's houses and, you know, just snack here or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he was... I never heard him say anything, and he was always very, very um, to himself. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it's just sort of thinking, looking back, you know, once I had the capacity to write about things and remembering, looking back, just wishing I had had, um, you know, some sort of dialogue, you know, with him. But, you know, I was a kid and he was a kid and, you know, we were just sort of aware of each other, but also not really. We knew that something was, there was a, there was a, there was a, a, a wall between us, but um, I always felt really sort of, I don't know, I empathized with him. Okay. Um, and then the next one is a very close friend of our family um, who, who I love very dearly and, you know, who I've seen sort of grow up and, you know, just talking about her and thinking about her as this sort of traveler, mm -hmm. you know, through the, the, the city. Okay. Um, and then uh, the last one is a really good friend of mine who I met while I was studying abroad in Vienna. Okay. Who was um, a refugee. And okay. And had so, or or really, I think also more more so, uh, an asylum seeker who, mm -hmm. um, who you know had dreams of playing soccer and you know sort of encountered the the politics of Europe and it's 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 um, immigration. And the game of soccer so deeply that uh, right that he came you know he was recruited from Nigeria and then sort mm -hmm. of encountered the immigration politics in Europe and um, you know just sort of figured had to figure out his way. Um, through the system, and, um, and and is still a very good friend of mine to this day. And so, um, did he ever become a, a professional at soccer? No, or? he didn't. He was recruited for a few teams throughout Europe, and then got injured, and you know, had to figure it out for himself. And so now he's a businessman, and he um, he, he he's doing well in his business. But um, he, I remember how much he loved soccer and how much he really wanted to play soccer. But you know, he he. He, he he had to navigate, navigate the, the sort of passport to politics, okay. and so it was a it was a challenge. Um, so that poem was really sort of a a tribute to him um, and the experience that that he made. So I call that Five Shades of Brown. Five Shades um, of Brown. And uh, okay, you know, so brown in many different shades in different places and experiences. Very deep. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. That's I mean, like, I, I really feel that my spirit. And I send him to the Moco. Right. No, absolutely. 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 Mm -hmm. um, and so um, uh, this next poem is a poem that I wrote, um, I would say here recently. It's sort of a... You write this when you were here at NYU or when you were actually living in New York or... Tell me about that. 
This is a poem that was written, I would say, between New York and Berlin. So okay. while I was in, living in New York, but I was traveling in Berlin. I was okay. over in Berlin working with the New Night Babies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got together and um, the music started to come together. And then me and Phil, the other writer, got together and we started writing things. And so this was sort of a, a piece of, of, of writing that came out that I think didn't get developed until a couple of years later. When uh, when I came back to it, okay, uh, and so uh, and it's also part of uh, a piece that that had been written before. So and that's the thing about um, at least my own sort of po poetic process is that you know I could write like ten lines uh, today and may not really actually sort of they may not become a part of an official poem until maybe three years later when um, when it's time. Right. You know, and so it, it's time it, is critical, right? Right, and it's a continuous process. You mm -hmm. know, it's very iterative when you come back and you go back and you go back and you go back and you do it again. So, um, um, when the groove opens up, slide through something like Usher's Do You at the Church Pew, poem, poems of pearl white gloves leading you like scarecrows down from poles and before you know it you're jumping feet first behind Alice chasing rabbits into the dark and on the other side is a film of trombone ballads with trumpets stuck in G flat with a soloist crooning the most psychedelic outcast outro telling you to watch out for the paws and poppies man you missed it following around with Diana falling hard in the pink in comes Sunra slow moaning with broomsticks shuffling across snare drums urging you to put the piano with the sax. Slow down the bass line, give it to the guitar. Send the synthetic to the low end of the interlude and then bring the whistle forward just behind the bass line. And then the upright bass faces forward while fingers pluck you into the rhyme. Singing, this is the music. This is the music. This is the music. In a strange place, memories of home be Trickling up your spine like that, I climb my way back to a summer free snack. Backflips out of a broken swing and sand castles with dreams trapped outside. Outside, the sidewalk burns the sole of my feet because my ride left me with no flip-flops. And round here, the grass grows only between the cracks of hopscotch. I break my mama's back in a verbal attack about washing the dishes. Then I get grown to hip-hop non-stop on the clock from 8 to 5. Stay finding a new tune to hum this jive to. I will survive too, my mama said, to words beneath the mortgage company letterhead. And I asked her, how are you so peace being alone? Ain't you fed up with not being wed yet? Nah, child, I ain't seen nothing true the world said yet. So that is sort of a, I think, a, um, a medley of poems there. Okay. Um, a sort of cocktail of poems, okay. if you will. And um, yeah, you know, just always, always the memory is always sort of driving the poetry too. Um, yeah. For me, um, I'm really big on imagery, you know, and trying to just sort of like retell the thing that happened as it happened, you know, um, as best as I can with words, trying to repaint it, you know, that exact moment. So um, I think maybe if I were a, a visual artist, I might be a painter. Uh, <laughs> um, to sort of capture moments, you know, uh, and portraits and different things like that. But um, as a as a, a person of words, you know, I just try and to use the memory as I guess the canvas, and then the the paint becomes the the poetry becomes the the paint and the and the sort of picture. So. Okay. Well, the picture was quite clear, <laughs> and. Um, so, so your mom, you, you really love her, like, you know that. Oh yeah, that's my favorite girl. <laughs> you know, she's um, she was my first audience, and she is always sort of uh, many times the first person to hear a new poem. Um, I can always call her and go, I wrote this new poem. You want to hear it? And she's like, Yeah, I do <laughs> want to hear it. So um, you know, and she'll listen, and sometimes she'll ask me questions, and sometimes she'll just think. You know, she'll just sort of like reflect and. You know, she'll always tell me, you know, how much she she really, you know, she really understands, um, and uh, and so she's 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 a big fan, and she's um, she's very supportive. So, 
Uh, so yeah, you know, and it's her family that I'm always writing about. And, you know, it's it's, it's well, it's, you're a part of her. Right, I know, I mean, of course, but I'm saying it's it's sort of um, the branch. The tree is right, right there, and the, right, you know, right, the branch. And right. So she knows it best, you know. And so when yeah, I write, really, something, she does. Right. So mm -hmm. when I write a poem and I'm talking about one of my siblings or something that happened in our family, and she's like, "Yeah, that's exactly what happened," you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's, you know, uh, you know, that's, that's the experience that we made as a, as a family. Right. And, um, So you don't, you don't do like most families where you just sit around and you might talk, I won't call it gossip, but where you just have a discussion, a family discussion, but through your poems. Right. She can tell, um, you know, which son it is and which daughter it is. Right, and if it's right, a, right. Right, she always knows exactly or, who I'm talking about, right. you know, and okay. so, and it's funny because they'll hear the poem and they'll go, is that about me? Because some of that sounds like what happened to me and I'm like, well, yeah, it was inspired, so. Well, this was just one great show, Miss Juan Amber Maloney. Thank you so and much I for having me. I just want you to know that um, it was fantastic. And now I just want you to say goodbye to the audience. Well, thank you guys so much for, uh, for listening. I appreciate it. And, uh, and I hope to be back with you soon. Thank you and very I much. And I thank you. And I guarantee you that she'll be back. Also, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a great November day. Yes, absolutely. And turkey gobble gobble. <laughs> Thanks Happy much. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah.